Uh, well, number one, we love Holland. We love coming to Holland. I, I came here 49 years ago the first time. Uh, I love also the fact that everybody, almost everybody, speaks English better than I do. Um, we love its cities. We love its landscape. We love the historical architecture, and especially the, ar the historical architecture of the last century of the uh, 20th century, <clears throat> where the early part of the century on into the middle, uh, the influence was enormous in the rest of the world and very significant. Uh, the rest of the world learned, uh, we could say, learning from Holland. Um, the, um, just to mention also, thank you to uh, Karen Tunison, who's been so good to us and who has organized this so beautifully and has so graciously invited us. Uh, we're very impressed by the number of signs in this building as we walk through it, both, related, both uh, pertaining to us, but also to things in general and their wit. Maybe I don't really have to get... Yeah. Well, that's... Okay. Um, so as I said, I don't... The, the, the number of signs are very impressive here, and since the subject of my part of the lecture is signage, maybe I don't really have to give the lecture. I'm, you already know what I'm going to say what I'm going to talk about. Um, but anyhow, it is a, a great delight to be here and see so many people, very impressive. Uh, my part of the lecture, to put it, to generalize, will be more about architecture and our ideas concerning architecture, which, by the way, you seem to know an awful lot about. Maybe you really don't have to give the lecture. Uh, and then also, Denise will emphasize more uh, planning and uh, urban design. Uh, so let us start. I think we're oh, too many slides, so I'm going to try to go relatively quickly. Um, does this work? Yes. It does. Yes, good. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, this is um, a, um, in America, a famous uh, painting by a painter named Thomas Cole uh, called uh, The Architect's Dream of the Mid. 19th century, which we enjoy very much, but we've also enjoyed sort of um, editing it or adding to it. Uh, and uh, the reason we do this is to emphasize that our approach in general is one that says, ah, oh, let's acknowledge uh, high, uh, low culture as well as high culture. Let's acknowledge the varieties of culture. Uh, let's acknowledge, to use in the, 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 the current uh, uh, language, uh, pop culture. Uh, and uh, this combination we think is very rich. And we think it's especially appropriate in this era when, there, when there's this emphasis on multiculturalism and so many cultures come together. So that in this era where there is enormous universality, there is ironically, of course, uh, multiculturalism and variety and contrast. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the general approach here is going to be uh, architecture as communication, we say for the information age, let's say architecture is communication rather than space. It is space, but space has been the, the term used to describe architecture more than any other in the 20th century. It was the word to use. Um, and of course, it is significant, but we are now saying let's relate to uh, communication for the information age rather, the, rather than the industrial age involving iconography rather than abstract expressionism, what you could call, which was very much part of the modern uh, movement, um, involving convention rather than heroic and original, acknowledging the everyday, the ordinary, rather than the dramatique, acknowledging the vernacular, uh, the generic vernacular rather than the, you could say, exotic, uh, evolutionary pragmatic approach uh, rather than revolutionary and meaningful. And sometimes revolution is appropriate, but uh, sometimes it is used just for inappropriate reasons to, to be spectacular. So let's acknowledge that it's okay to be evolutionary and pragmatic rather than uh, kind of um, the opposite. The idea of mannerism interests us very much, a mannerist rather than expressionistic. And I'm going to talk about mannerism later more. Are you hearing me better up there? 
Okay. Uh, electronic technology for the electronic age rather than electric. That should be electric, uh, electric games, if you will, uh, which exists still a lot today. <clears throat> Changing messages and ornament for multiculturalism rather than abstract purity. I like to say the rather thans because the comparative method of analysis is, is, uh, is helpful. And then what you could call later, we'll, I'll talk further about this, digital splendor rather than gloomy glow. Okay. Uh, next, please. Of course, a lot of this uh, started from our learning from Las Vegas, period. We learned a lot from Las Vegas of going there, and we learned a lot about symbolism uh, and signage, of course, in a more literal way. So architecture is sign involving the commercial vernacular, um, and that is interesting because it's interesting in the early other century, 20th century, uh, you Europeans learned a lot and taught us a lot about the um, <clears throat> American industrial uh, vernacular. <clears throat> Sorry, and then my throat is getting bad here. A little water would help, yes. But it is kind of fun that the industrial vernacular was, it was a very much an inspiration for modern architecture and its vocabulary, uh, combining with abstraction, ironically, also. And now it's, we think, the commercial vernacular that we can learn from. Uh, urbanism as auto-driven, involving the uh, space and scale for the automobile. And a lot of the early planning uh, of the uh, city planning of the early period did not really uh, acknowledge the significance, dominance of the uh, automobile. Next slide. So Las Vegas or Los Angeles are very important there. With a valid precedent uh, of architecture, like, it's good to talk about the precedent in the classic modern, the early mid 20th century. Again, uh, dealing, uh, in, in engaging uh, uh, contra. Uh, uh, contrast involving, ironically, this cl classic architecture of the modern that, that preceded our t uh, this time, although some people are still are beginning to revive it, uh, was abstract form and space, the industrial symbolism. Uh, there's, a, there's a contradiction there. Of how can you be abstract and also involve symbolism? But somehow that was done. And then, of course, the functional designing from the inside out. Frank Lloyd Wright said that, Le Corbusier said that. They were enemies, but they both said that. They both agreed on that. Next slide. Um, the Villa Savoie might be one of the, one of the great examples uh, of, the, um, of the century. It's my favorite building of the 20th century. I adore it. And of course, it does very much represent uh, Le Corbusier's definition in English, translated into English, architecture being the masterly correct and magnificent play of masses brought together in light. What could be more, uh, what could involve more the idea of abstraction. Uh, next slide. Um, there's also, of course, the, the, what I, what, which I just mentioned, is these are, all, these are out of the Le, Cor, Le Corbusier book, Vers in Architecture, uh, the, the uh, uh, grain elevators of America and the American industrial uh, vernacular. And it is kind of ironical that the Central Europeans came to America and discovered the validity of this, not the Americans. And of course, in 1910, circa 1910, Agropius did this building that looks like a factory. It is a factory, but he was happy that it was a factory. And this building that looks like a factory, deriving very much from this. And of course, Mies van der Rohe did that too. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. in this very, very uh, generalized um, uh, review of the architecture that preceded our era, uh, which we learned from and evolve out of, there is, I call the invalid precedent, I'm, I'm not sympathetic the way I, am, I was to the architecture that I just discussed, uh, the revolutionary utopian urban. Uh, urbanism was revolutionary utopia. You did a V radius. Here's Paris, Le Corbusier, the Ile de la Cité here. He saved uh, the Pantheon, he saved uh, Saint, uh, the, the uh, Notre Dame, uh, but the, this center, historical center of Paris was removed and it became a park with high rise in it. Uh, so this was the, uh, 
evolution, revolutionary utopia of what would be done. This is what we are not sympathetic to in the last century. Uh, not uh, evolutionary pragmatism, which is what we are. And, and this is very different. The um, Frank Lloyd Wright's ideal city called um, Broadacre City, very different from this, but also, of course, terribly dominated by the architect, the genius architect, the, uh, the uh, for one, one class, if you will, or one kind of culture uh, by Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, it's a sort of American suburbanism idealized. Next slide, please. So invalid current architecture. Now, I did, again, I'm being nasty here, but I am, uh, and again, using this not to be nasty, but to emphasize, to help describe what we are for. And in this neo-modernism of today, what's happened since the real modernism of the past, you could say, and the way I'm uh, analyzing it, you have one abstract expressionism, industrial dramatique. And it's sort of an irony that we're in the electronic age and the industrial dramatique, uh, where you have also a lot of rivets all over the architecture. Well, rivets went out way before, you know, decades ago. Um, they're the kind of the equivalent of egg and darts, um, uh, maybe um, ornament. Uh, electronic glow, historical revivalism, in a way. Electric glow, electric glow. Again, this was, I'm oh, sorry about this mistake. Historical revivalism, I consider this historical revivalism really reviving uh, the great architecture of the, uh, the uh, mid-century, uh, which is no different from reviving, let's say, historical Renaissance architecture. Uh, and the, these are just examples of what I'm, what I'm talking about here, of the invalid current architecture of dramatique uh, uh, revival. Uh, next slide, or a few more. Some of these are a little embarrassing, I think, in this context. I'm sorry about that. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what we are not for. Uh, so what we are to get back is architecture is sign, explicit communication, engaging precedence of the commercial vernacular, the historical iconog iconographic architecture, which I'll go into in a minute, conventional loft architecture, which can be so appropriate for now. The, the opposite of the dramatique uh, architecture that is full of um, a dramatic uh, a form, uh, articulated form. This is for the automobile age, for the electronic age. Here, electronic is correct. Uh, for the information age, the information age. Next slide, please. Uh, so we learned, we went to this American vernacular uh, commercial, uh, the highway. We learned about this. Here's communication for cars going 40 or 50 miles an hour along along highways. Here is here is an industrial a vernacular a building that, that can be appropriate for us now. And then, of course, the American billboards. Uh, and this we learn from. This horrifies Americans, because Americans are so afraid of being vulgar, of being vulgar. But it's, more, it's much more important to be vulgar than to be dull. Next slide, please. Sometimes I call this architecture unex uh, uh, boring excitement. And anyhow, this is uh, we call, we called going from learning from learning from Las Vegas. We went from Rome to Las Vegas. We learned a lot about space in Rome in the early days. Uh, and we were doing this again as the Las Vegas of now or of then. It's not the Las Vegas of now. It's very significant that Las Vegas is not this way uh, 30 or 40 years later. <clears throat> and this is uh, the Las Vegas of then that we learned from. Again, the architecture of, of the urbanism involving communication. Next slide, please. Could you focus this, sir, please? A little better, thank you. And again, again this, and this, and these analyses of Las Vegas that we made of the buildings that were back from the, uh, back from the, uh, from the road, uh, accommodating parking, and then right in back in Las Vegas, you had the desert. Does this look familiar? That's Denise Scott Brown. Uh, uh, when we went there in 1968, 66, 66. And this is again a kind of an, we can't read this now, but this is our analysis of this kind of architecture of then, which was appropriate. Next slide, and of now. Uh, this was, of course, in a famous book by a, an architect who referred to this as horrible. And I had fun saying, hey, this is good. 
And Denise made this distinction between architecture as the duck, which is valid, i.e. is architecture as sculpture, perfectly valid, and then architecture as the shed, the decorated shed. We think this is probably the architecture more for now than this, although there's been great architecture in the past that was duck. And uh, this is the highway, the sign, and the simple building, or maybe the false facade. And then maybe the monument now can be not deriving from articulated form and scale, but from scale and, electro and um, iconography, signage. Next slide, please. So iconography and symbol, there's the idea of historical precedent, which really is important. The mural as a message rather than art. That's an interesting idea. In this book by Sylvia Levin's mother, The Place of Narrative, essentially her, uh, her uh, fascinating um, uh, thesis is that uh, the uh, great art uh, in the form of Italian um, murals, we look at, well, we look at as great art. But essentially, it was first message system. The content was important. It was what was being said. And then that was done in a way that was good and artful and effective. And therefore, it is also art. But it wasn't art first. It was essentially iconography and content first. Very interesting idea. Very different from the kind of ideas that I grew up with. Next slide, please. And I have a series just of not nice historical slides. This is, of course, not a really Greek building, but it reminds us of the Greek a later building in Philadelphia. But it remind, reminds us that there is this art in the pediment, but the art was essentially giving you a message uh, concerning uh, the uh, religion. Uh, there is this kind of architecture, which is teeming with hieroglyphics uh, all over all of the uh, surfaces our sign, our message is its architecture as sign par excellence. Uh, there, is, there are the great murals, there are the great murals, the great friezes, if you will, of early Christian architecture, either as murals or as um, mosaics. Uh, and uh, as been pointed out, uh, this, of course, the very important thing was this was teaching the community. This was, you were learning about religion, Catholicism from this, and this is an era when most of the uh, uh, citizens were illiterate. You find different scales here. So this is great art, but it is also architecture involving inside as opposed to outside a signage. Next slide, please. And symbolism, iconography, uh, the, great, the great Byzantine architecture, Baroque architecture. This is actually not a church, but the churches were essentially saying, don't become a Protestant counter-reformation. They were seducing you by the dramatic uh, effect. And of course, we look at these, the windows of the, of the Middle Ages, but we should look at them with care in detail where there's very specific messages being given that you learn from. Next slide, please. Uh, so information is very much part of it. I love this uh, mannerist architecture of the Elizabethan period, which very often had uh, signage in it, uh, on it. Uh, the facade of Reims or Amiens, I forget which this is, I guess, uh, was um, essentially a kind of three-dimensional billboard giving you lots of information. All over here is another, another kind of uh, pop culture, maybe, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, symbol dominating the, the uh, vernacular row house in, Phil in Philadelphia. Next slide, please. Uh, there is this garden, uh, the, the great gardens of Japan uh, in the Kyoto area where uh, there is kind of signage in the sense that there is a representation here, if you will, an idealization of nature uh, uh, and, of course, changed in scale, made miniature. Uh, there is one exception in the 20th century where the um, Russian constructivists did use signage very much, really very interestingly different from what was going on in uh, Europe, uh, where this would not exist. But these, these guys did use uh, signage on their otherwise simple abstract forms. And then, of course, there is the vernacular Main Street of America, which is teeming with commercial signage, this more at a, at an, at a, at a pedestrian scale. Main Street. Next slide, please. So all of these are very, I think, lively and beautiful examples. 
all sorts. There is then this kind of American of now system of the billboards, but, the, but in America, this is always separate from this. This is always separate from this. Maybe they could be connected. So viva conventional, looking at the conventional and looking at the generic and learning from it. And the generic is something that modern architecture has learned from, but then, then, has, then has extended beyond. Next slide. Um, so viva the loft. This is, again, the, uh, the shed, if you will. And there's a long example of this. You know, the Italian palazzo is essentially a loft for three or 400 years. The, it was a generic building that was essentially the same with a courtyard inside um, that could uh, uh, change over time. Certainly the facade style changed from Renaissance to Baroque, but it could change over time in terms of uses. It could be the home of a uh, dynastic family. It could then become a library, an embassy, a museum. Uh, the, or the, the great uh, American uh, academic architecture, uh, William and Mary College, Nassau Hall, Princeton, were essentially lofts in which different things could happen uh, over time and, and through the spaces. It, it allows for flexibility. Next slide. So there's a lot of validity for this. And we like to say that, uh, according to what we're saying now, it's not form follows function, which was the ideal of the American, of the, uh, excuse me, of the modern, uh, our modern style, but form accommodates functions with an S. It's a little like in the modern buildings where the form followed function in a very explicit way. This finger is longer than that finger and that kind of thing. Whereas we are saying maybe the mitten uh, is, 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 is appropriate where the fingers can wiggle inside. Um, this is uh, another comparison is Louis Kahn's famous uh, Richardson's Tower, which the people who used it hated it and hate it. Uh, it was uh, articulated, it was dramatique, uh, and it did not allow for flexibility inside. It was not a loft. It was telling you now, 50 years from now, the building has to be used in the same way, whereas a loft building uh, can, can, allow, can be a mitten and can allow, can allow for flexibility. We do lots of loft uh, of, um, laboratory buildings. Then the ends can be dramatique. There could be some, analysis, some opportunity there for being dramatic and, com and being comparing. And then also there's the opportunity for explicit ornament on the building, which would not exist in this building. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So conventional rather than original, ABBA egotecture. And let's, let's look at these wonderful, unashamedly generic uh, orders of buildings that we know of, the, the, the uh, classical temple, uh, the basilica that then became a, with a Roman law court, and then the Christians came and made it a church by adding the, this, this idea, uh, the, um, the dome, and of course, the palazzo. So there is a great example of great historical architecture that is generic, essentially. Next slide. That is good rather than original. Uh, I love saying uh, Michelangelo, maybe the, in my opinion, the greatest architect in Western civilization. Well, he did this 100 years later from this one, uh, Brunelleschi, in uh, Florence. And he wasn't ashamed of using essentially the same form. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Sorry about my throat. <laughs> uh, evolutionary rather than revolutionary, every day promote heroic utopia via revolutionary. Yesterday was that. Today, accommodate pragmatic reality via evolution, glory of the everyday. And of course, that is the different fr difference from Korb's idea, even though he did the building that I admire the most in the history of the 20th century, I very much disagree with tearing Paris down uh, and replacing the center with this, the V Radius, which was the revolutionary utopian idea rather than the pragmatic evolutionary idea of urbanism that also accommodated signage and also uh, uh, um, uh, encouraged communication, which encourages community. There was very little sense of community in this kind of neighborhood. 
Next slide, please. So learning from Las Vegas, learning, learning from learning from Las Vegas, learning from everything we've been talking about. Viva realism, ABBA, expressionism. Uh, let me just go through a few uh, examples of how we have done this uh, in, in our history. Now, I think most people in this, in this uh, audience probably know more about our, our architecture than we do. We obviously all, I see all the signs here with our buildings on them. Uh, but anyhow, a potpourri involving uh, work that, emer that uh, engages uh, iconography and electronics for an architecture of communication. Now, there's a lot of, uh, I'm going to emphasize the communicative part of our, of, of our um, work, uh, but I am not going to be talking about an extremely important part, which is programmatic accommodation, uh, which is um, uh, program and structure and others. That's not because they haven't been important, but because that's not the subject here. Next, please. Uh, so there was an exhibition of our work uh, in Philadelphia a while back called Out of the Ordinary, which we enjoyed the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the title. Uh, and they sold books. They sold uh, caps. You could buy ugly and ordinary, or you could buy heroic and original. And of course, we were for this. And this derived from uh, an architect in, uh, on the Fine Arts Commission in Washington uh, when we presented a building we did, he called it ugly and ordinary, and it did not pass. And we took that as a great compliment when we considered who said it. Bur his name was uh, Gordon Bunchaft of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Uh, and we made that a motto of our office, ugly and ordinary, rather than heroic and original. Next slide. Uh, so very quickly, this is a very early uh, scheme we did uh, way back for the uh, competition for the Roosevelt uh, Memorial along the Potomac River, uh, where, it was, where there was a um, promenade along the river, and then there was uh, the promenade sort of evolved into a, a mural wall and a kind of a frieze. And along that, as you walked, you could read about or learn about or see illustrated ideas concerning Roosevelt. Now, that was very unusual at the time to have a monument that would explain, that would involve symbolism, communication uh, there. Then you could walk through it this way, and then we were being very American. Back here, there would, there would be parking, and the parking there would be hidden, but it would be, it would be, uh, it would be explicitly part of the Dagon, not something in the backyard, uh, which you didn't ex ex acknowledge in the architecture, because most of the people who would come here would come by car and walk. Naturally, we did not win the competition. Next slide, please. Uh, this mother's house, which I, I did emphasize how it evolved, it has evolved so much out of the V, of the uh, Villa, Villa Savoie, although extremely different. The Villa Savoie, because it had this idea of layering, uh, it had openings in the wall, uh, and it had variety and contrast behind the front layer. But the Villa Savoie did not have this symbolic quality where this house became a kind of generic house. It was a house kind of that a child would draw. And it was going back to the idea of the building having symbolic content uh, and a reference uh, to the past. And also, this is the first window. This is all over the world now. This is the first window in modernism, and late modernism. You never had a window. This was what you did in those days. Uh, the, uh, the building by Le Corbusier, by uh, Mies van der Rohe. Uh, and uh, this was the window. And then it also had explicit ornament. It had this, this element. It had, that was explicit ornament. That was absolutely unheard of. Young people here will not understand how horrifying, how horrifying this building was uh, to people at the time. And, uh, I had a lot of work to get that central. You could get, you could get normal uh, sliding glass there, but you, uh, to get that in to make it look like a window was uh, very difficult. Uh, because in those days, you had absence of wall, or you had the window made into a stripe, a strip window. But you never had a window as a hole in the wall. So I returned to that idea with some horror. Next slide, please. And uh, I don't know why I included this, but it, I, oh, well, it, it's also with green. I read, uh, Marcel Breuer I read once, was in the library at Yale where I was teaching there, he said, you never use green as a, 
as a, for, on the exterior of architecture and the building. And I said, oh, I'm going to go back and have my mother's house painted green. So that's what happened. Um, and then this is a house that, again, had windows in it. Uh, this is a, a, a housing for the elderly that had windows. It had a great big sign. It had duality. In other words, it had a column in the middle. That was mannerist and unheard of. Uh, it had an arched window. My mother's house had that in the back. Uh, but it, had, oh, it was not a slab. Uh, and it had lots of corners, so that it allowed people to have corner rooms to look out both ways of the windows. Uh, it had a, a, a fence that was very ordinary. Next slide, please. Uh, so the ordinary. We had signage here. This sign was removed because the neighbors were so outraged that within six months the sign was removed. It was a grand restaurant on an old building. We, we did have, have our revenge that 10 years or so later, we could put the sign on the um, Whitney Museum on Madison Avenue for an exhibition in, Phil in uh, New York City. Next slide, please. We also used, uh, well, we, did, we, do, we did houses that looked like houses. Uh, we learned a lot from Vincent Scully's a book called The Shingle Style. But we also did houses that did not look like houses. And I, I loved later realizing that this Roman Catholic lived next door, and we gave them a gave the, this Mar Virgin Mary a halo. Anyhow, but this again is duality, duality, which is unusual. Next slide. Um, we this uh, was uh, changing a Catholic church to accommodate the new um, rituals of about 25 years ago. We put neon in it. This was re removed. Uh, after about nine months because the people were outraged by neon inside of a church. We designed very carefully the detail. Next slide. Again, the ordinary. This is my favorite building maybe we've ever done, which is the competition entry for a football hall of fame. It was to be a great, it never was built. We didn't win it. Uh, it was to be a great uh, kind of museum for the football. And on the outside, we made it a... Um, a, an American billboard where you could park and have lunch over here and watch changing, uh, changing uh, information here. Uh, then when you went inside, there was a kind of, um, it was almost like a church nave, because when we read the program, we realized that they were considering football uh, players as almost religious figures, like saints within the history. And so we gave them a kind of a, um, uh, we, we put them up here in, in, uh, in terms of um, murals so that they were like Gothic, uh, not like a Baroque murals of saints painted in the ceiling. But instead of saints, they were football players. And then in the Roman Catholic Church in Italy, of course, along the nave, on one side in this case, you have chapels. And in these chapels, you have relics, the fingernail of a saint or something like that. So here we have relics, which are maybe the sweatshirt or something of the... Uh, of the different players. So we have a kind of uh, symbolic quality here of making this a truly holy place for the athletes. Next slide. Uh, this is a building we did, very low budget building in Philadelphia. We did use, not, we did use modernist windows, i.e. strips, uh, but we did use ornament on the facade. This is still here, it's beautifully maintained uh, by the owners. And then we had very specific ornament at the same time at the bottom in contrast. We also did, for a wonderful client named Best Products, uh, we did um, buildings with no windows, and we put explicit ornament on the outside. Next slide, please. And then this is our first academic building in addition to this beautiful building, which is a museum in uh, Oberlin College, uh, and we did uh, ornament here. We used the same materials, the same colors, but we did a, an overall pattern for, again, a loft building with just light coming in from above. It looked, people made fun of it and said it looked like this kind of a shirt. Next slide, please. But in that building, inside, you could look out of the window, and this is maybe the first time in the century that there was a reference to, within modern architecture, to historical, uh, to a historical element, i.e., what we called not an ionic column, but an ironic column. Uh, and uh, this was just one column you saw out of the window. We did, a, in Washington, a... Uh, in 1976, a, uh, an exhibition on signage. Next slide, please. 
uh, we did a building like this. This was, an, this was an existing building. It was bought by a company called Basco, where you could buy products, and we made these, this as a sign along the highway. Uh, uh, 20, 30 years later, the Museum of Modern Art uh, did a, 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 a building outside of New York uh, uh, in Brooklyn, uh, and they had a sign like this. So we enjoy saying, hey, we're 30 years ahead of the Museum of Modern Art, uh, so maybe we are pre-modern, certainly not post-modern. Next slide, please. <laughs> this was a competition we did not win, um, but the winner didn't, they didn't build the winner thing, where we did this, um, ex this um, hall for the, I think it was 1976, something like that, exhibition in uh, World's Fair in Seville, and we made it a great big loft building where all sorts of things could happen inside, great richness inside, and on the outside there was a great sign. And the one who won was a very articulated piece of architecture. It was very expensive, and they could not afford it in the end. Next slide, please. This, just, this is sort of going more, more or less chronologically. This is the building at Penn, where again we did a, a, a generic loft building uh, with ornament, with some variety on the end, and then with explicit signage here, which you could see from the highway in here somewhere, I think, over there. So you could see it within this context. This is the University of Pennsylvania, this is beyond it, and you see the building. And it was very nice that Penn would let us do this. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, this is a, a design for a um, pavilion also in another World's Fair, I won't go into that. But it was the idea of uh, making the, the World's Fair, it was to be in Philadelphia in 76, it didn't happen, uh, it was to be, uh, the, 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 the plan was that of a highway where different variety of things could happen on the side. And as you approached from the airport to go to, the, to Philadelphia at that time, we said, for the World's Fair, uh, we said, oh, let's have signage that relates to Philadelphia. And we had famous things in Philadelphia, sort of, which is the hoagie, which is a kind of, um, yes, hoagie, which is a kind of, uh, of a sandwich that Philadelphia is famous for. And then we have Poussin, uh, which is in our museum. Uh, next slide, please, as a highway. Uh, we did a, a, a building in, uh, for a city in California named Thousand Oaks, where the, the city hall would be seen from a highway here, and where it would be a, just a, a conventional building, where there'd be some uh, iconography here, this represents an oak leaf, and there would be signage here, uh, as you could do it. It was a practical building where you could, like a kind of commercial inspiration. You could drive up here to get your driver's license. You drive over here to pay your taxes, you different things. Next slide, please. Again, very uh, automobile oriented. <clears throat> this is some furniture we did, William and Mary style. Uh, this is the building that Karen uh, uh, mentioned for a, uh, a student center in um, uh, the University uh, of Delaware, uh, where we, they let us use um, um, neon and where we used signage and where it was a wonderful place to meet people. It was a way through the building. It was a continuation, Denise will talk about this, the continuation of a way outside the building that you walk through. You can sit and talk with your friends here, meet some people, you meet people incidentally, you met sense of community, and then all sorts of things were here. You could buy a hamburger or something over here. We admire very much this building where you have a way through the building and where you can dine and talk as well, which we saw as we came in. And it's teeming with signage. Also with uh, Robert Venturi's name on, above the uh, men's room sign, I noticed. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a building well known in London, very much understood. But it's a building where we said, ah, oh, you can get, um, you can get um, harmony via contrast as well as uh, analogy. So these here, we were re replicating the exact vocabulary of the new building, the old building. Uh, but at the same time, we relate that their positioning was different. This is involves beautiful uh, rhythm, the original building of 1830, 1840. Uh, but it's sort of the rhythm of a gavotte or a minuet. This is the rhythm of jazz, if you will. And it also, this building inflects toward the old building. 
This building would not make any sense if it were seen alone. It is inflecting toward the old building. But also, most important, as it's facing Trafalgar Square, it is a sign. In other words, the historical quality does not go around the corner. It is just for this part of the, as context for this uh, space. Uh, and therefore, this is a, a modernist a facade, which you can't see very well in this photograph, but it is a kind of Mies van der Rohe, a form of, uh, of glass. Next slide, please. Uh, this is what we did for fun once. This was to be a sign museum in Las Vegas. It was never built. Um, and then uh, this was a building where it, this, it, this uh, part of it just evolved slightly here and it became a sign. It's a, a, a fire station. This is a fire station that was built that was to be enjoyable for children to look at. Uh, these are very big bricks, made not of brick, uh, for Orlando, Florida, where a lot of children go to Disney World. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our building in Toulouse, France, a, a, a governmental uh, capital of a province. Um, I think this could be uh, adjusted a little better. I don't, he doesn't. Uh, for, uh, could be a better uh, focused. Uh, and on this building, we connected very much with the context. Toulouse is a, one of the most beautiful cities in the world and very red brick kind of city. Uh, and we did that, but then we had contrasting elements. Uh, and then we had uh, ornament here that related to uh, different um, to the, to historical kinds of ornament on buildings made much bigger in scale. Uh, and then we had representations of two columns which were on the site originally, which had been torn down as entrances to the city of Toulouse. And we, we referred to them by these not reproductions of classical columns, but representations of columns. Next slide, please. Uh, this is that building again in its context where there's a way through, a, uh, a uh, pedestrian way through where people can meet and connect and where there can be a sense of community uh, and which is on the outside white and on the inside red brick. And then also there is the uh, governmental legislative hall uh, where there could not be windows but we want it to look like a hall and not an auditorium. So we put decorative windows and then three feet behind, we have paintings of clouds rather like Magritte. Uh, so, and then we'd have real windows up here. And again, ornament here, specific ornament. Next slide, please. Uh, we were asked by the University of Mission to extend their, uh, their arena, their stadium, because they were no longer the biggest stadium in the country because another one had been built. So we extended it so that they could again become the biggest state, the, the biggest stadium. And as we extended, we put 13 rows of seats around here. So it looked like this down below. And then we had an ornamental uh, uh, iconographic element uh, around here. We called it a halo, uh, a halo the way a saint has a halo, uh, and with, with wording on it. Um, this had to be removed after two years because it was considered vulgar. <laughs> Next slide, please. But on the other hand, just before the last game, we went and took pictures, and here these people had signs all over their bodies and all over their clothes. But that was not appropriate for architecture. <laughs> so, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a building we did for the National Museum of Scotland, again, a competition we did not win. We had signage all over the loft building, all sorts of opportunities for variety inside over time. We were in the tradition of the, uh, of the Bibliothèque um, Sainte Genevieve in Paris, and there, I think there are over 900 names of uh, great people, uh, great uh, uh, individuals in the Western culture. I think about 80% of them are French, but anyhow, <laughs> there are a few Greeks in there. Okay, uh, so we were following that tradition, we thought. Next slide. This is the Stedelijk Museum, which I will not dwell on, but it was a, comp a, a competition we won uh, where our building extended like this over here uh, and made sense in terms of the usage inside. And then on the outside, we made a facade which was, um, did involve iconography and signage. This gave you information as you went down the street. I'm sorry, it's hard to see in this slide, but it was, a, again, a facade. 
uh, that uh, covered a building that was very different in behind, the great entrance here, and which had very explicit information that could be changing information. This was the interior of the hall as you went in. Next slide, please. This is a hotel which was built in Japan in the countryside. Uh, and here we made the buildings essentially loft buildings again uh, to connect. I think the focus could be better uh, to connect with um, these are athletic buildings here. These are hotel buildings here. And then on the surface, we put uh, uh, symbolic elements that uh, referred to a traditional architecture uh, the, the, uh, that you find. And then we put, this is Mondrian's uh, uh, Broadway Boogie Woogie over here, and this is a Mondrian form. So we kind of connected Mondrian with the typical uh, traditional uh, structure of the historical buildings, but it was explicitly ornament. Then when you were inside, there was a way through the building with all sorts of signage and neon. Uh, and representations of a, of a, a street, of, of a village, a typical village uh, street. Next slide, please. They were wonderful clients. They loved what we were doing. This is kind of a drawing of the street through uh, with uh, sort of signs indicating typical elements that you see, banners, uh, electrical elements, uh, telephones. They have green telephones. So we, the way, the way uh, the American pop artists took a typical element, made it bigger, gave it a different context, a different medium. We did the same thing with this element. This is more green than it shows in the... Uh, there it is, there. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a part of the same uh, a complex where there is a, uh, there a uh, swimming pool, and above the swimming pool we have all sorts of leaves because this is a part of Japan that's famous for its forests. And so as you're swimming this way, the, the ornamental leaves on top of the structure, exposed structure, are green. When you, when you uh, swim this way, it is autumn, and the, the leaves are yellow. Uh, next slide, please. This is a building we did for the Philadelphia Orchestra. It was never built. Uh, and on the outside, we gave it a kind of Mies van der Rohe uh, uh, vocabulary with a lot of glass and with um, but with red instead of black uh, Philadelphia has a lot of color uh, and then we put explicit uh, freeze along here this is the right hand of the third movement of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata slightly modified uh, then down below there's a lot of interesting information you can get from electronic technology as you walk below the building that was built is exceedingly boring as you walk by there's nothing to do but scratch your head or something like that. Um, and then, of course, the building changes at night, where this is really not glass, but um, what's that stuff called? It's spandrel glass. So it looks like glass in the day. At night, it's not. And then just the, the part that are, is glass, these look remind you a bit of columns, classical columns with a classical pediment. So it's a modern building with kind of classical reference. This building, the building that was built, was four times more expensive than our building. Next slide. By a famous architect. Uh, this is uh, the downstairs. These are rooms with... Focus, please. Yeah, this is a, a, a student center at uh, Princeton where there's uh, all sorts of moving iconography here. There's non-moving iconography here. There are comments here by um, famous... Uh, Princeton graduates. I think Venturi is there. I'm not sure. But anyhow. Um, and then there is on this great glass window, I'm sorry you can't see it, but there's a very faint uh, shield uh, of, uh, of, the, of the university. So again, we are employing, we're using color, we're using, we're, we're making this, uh, this an addition to an older building. This is the old part where you come in uh, and it's teeming with signage. Next slide, please. This is a, a, a student center in the basement of an older building, that, and we designed this for Harvard University Memorial Hall. We said the, the, uh, the aesthetic down here would be that of a teenager's bedroom. And we wanted it to look like an architect did not design it. And, but we do have over the uh, eating area and moving iconography at the end of this uh, way through, we have uh, changing iconography uh, 
LED. And then along here, we have all sorts of old-fashioned kind of communication with, where you stick with a pin, a different uh, idea. This is a, a board where you can say, uh, I'm, I'm going to New York next week by car. If you want to come with me, uh, you can come or whatever. All sorts of communication of that sort. So you have this kind of communication, this kind of communication. And then this is decorative lighting, different colors. But again, ordinary architecture. An architect did not really do this. We did it. Next slide. <laughs> uh, I'm going on too long here. This is a, 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 an older part of the campus at Princeton. This could be, I think, also better. Focused here, please. Um, and we do have here uh, signage. We've done chairs, which are modern, very modern technologically, but also referential historically. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a building that we'd won the competition for the Staten Island Ferry Terminal at the end of uh, Manhattan. This is the bottom of Manhattan. This is a terminal that goes to Staten Island. And we did this building, which we wanted to read well next to or very near the Statue of Liberty. This would be a 19th century a civic monument, and this would be a 20th century one. This clock, of course, was not a mechanical clock. It was a, to be a clock uh, that was electronic. But clocks are important for people who are traveling uh, to go to work across the, uh, the, the, uh, the bay. Next slide, please, uh, shows that, that was con we won the competition, but they reduced the budget. So we did a, a simpler building where, again, this was, uh, was electronic, would read well with the Statue of Liberty, and would give you different kinds of messages and information uh, on a changing information and sense of community where you could read different things uh, as you went but on the, on the, um, as you approached or left. Next slide, please. Um, this is the night, what it would be like at night, uh, ornament, and um, connected with the old building. And then we have explicit ornament here where we have in the back uh, decorative trees. And the neighborhood is very happy about this. This is at the edge of, in, in uh, New, ha New Haven. And the people who live at the edge in this poor neighborhood are very happy that the university is acknowledging them by having ornamental trees uh, at, the, at the edge. We're very grateful that Yale went through with this and paid for it. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm not going to go through this too much. It's a um, design for Philadelphia at the Delaware River, uh, where there is, a, along the Delaware River, there was our design using big letters again uh, for uh, a, a civic part uh, of the uh, edge of the city. This is a city behind. But because of time, I'm going to go through this. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, I think the last one I'm showing of our work are these two high rises that we've designed for the city of Shanghai. They are on hold now because all, all uh, uh, construction has been stopped. New construction has been stopped, but we'll go ahead again, we trust. And in this, we do a building as a loft, uh, then with ex explicit ornament on the surface. And this is electronic ornament. It can change, change colors, and things like that. There is a little bit of a touch of, ah, oh, I am a pagoda, even though I'm two buildings. Um, and uh, then there is explicit information given down here. And it is an irony that I'm the one who said, less is a bore, which was anti Mies van der Rohe. And now we're designing buildings that look like Mies van der Rohe. But then Mies van der Rohe would never have explicit ornament uh, on one of the facades. And it's a wonderful company. It's a development company called the Gorgeous Development Company. Uh, and they, uh, they love our scheme, and we trust it's going to go ahead. Next slide. Um, so in our, what I, I have this here just to show what our, what our designs are not like. They're not like this, which is what's happening now, which I think is, not, is boring, uh, exciting. Uh, and we are more in the tradition of this uh, in, on Times Square, where you have a building with, with um, Times Square communication, not this. Next slide, please. Um, learning from Tokyo, quickly I want to refer to, we learn a lot, valid chaos rather than minimalist order in that city. Electronic iconography for an architecture of communication. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
uh, and we look at we, there's this tradition, of course, which modern architects loved, the Kyoto tradition, which we love also, of, of, of brilliant, beautiful uh, um, uh, minimalism. But there is this tradition in Kyoto, in uh, Nikko, the tradition uh, of um, another tradition of the um, of the uh, religion and architecture uh, of um, Japan, and this is we learned from also. But modernists only learned from this; they did not; they ignored this. Next slide, please. Uh, and so this is the Ginza, which is just one of the most beautiful streets in the world of now. Uh, this are these pencil buildings, very narrow buildings that are built. And on every balcony, there's a sign. So this is architecture of communication par excellence in Tokyo. We are thrilled by Tokyo. We love it. But we also love uh, Shanghai. Next slide, please. Then we, parts of New York we love. This is uh, downtown uh, near, near Times Square, and this is Viva the Facada's computer screen. This is information giving concerning the stock market. Next slide. It's another uh, building uh, that is by um, uh, the firm of, um, what is the firm? Not SOM. KPF, Comb, Patterson, and Fox. A very uh, typical, uh, Times Square is right down here. This is on 7th Avenue. Very typical facade, not exciting architecture, very typical modernist architecture, but the facade surfaces that are not windows and have iconography, uh, facades not reflecting light, facades emanating light. Next slide, you see different uh, kinds of uh, messages uh, or ornament uh, on this facade, constantly changing. Sometimes there are words here giving you information concerning the stock market also. Next slide, please. And then there is Times Square, and we love Times Square. We think of Times Square as the, is the piazza of today. It is the equivalent of the Piazza San Marco of 500 years ago. And it's very interesting that, that you get immediate message systems along here right after 7-Eleven, immediately after 7-Eleven, there could be information for the community concerning the 7-Eleven episode. So it's very different from this, which is here for eternity. Next slide, please this being part of that. And we like to think of the pixels of, the, uh, of this kind of architecture, of this kind of, uh, electro of the electronic uh, LED screen would be the equivalent of the tessera of the mosaics. Next slide, please. Changing pixels for a multicultural age, or t the equivalent of tessera, engaging communication and mannerism. Next slide. I'm going to end on this series of a bit, bit of that mannerism. Mannerism, which is the architecture for now. It's something that really this book was about, and I have one of the great mannerist examples of architecture, the uh, Porta, uh, what is it, the Porta del Pia. How could I forget that? Porta Pia of Michelangelo. Complexity and contradiction. I mentioned mannerism here a lot. Maybe I should have called this mannerism. Today I would. Mannerism for architecture of our time, acknowledging conventional order rather than original expressionism, but breaking the conventional order to accommodate complexity and contradiction, and thereby accommodating ambiguity unambiguously. And of course, uh, the great uh, T.S. Eliot writes a lot about the validity of ambiguity. Next slide, please. Uh, and English architecture, I particularly love the architecture of the Elizabethan era. Of these architects, Hawksmore, Banborough, um, Inigo Jones, who use classicism but use it incorrectly in an exp in a, in a, for architecture that is highly dynamic. So I think mannerism is something that is a kind of trait uh, that goes within our, uh, English architecture. It's maybe my favorite architecture after Italy and the world. Next slide, please. Uh, and I love Palladio. And we think of Palladio not as a mannerist. We think of it as a very correct architecture with his villas that were reproduced by Thomas Jefferson and by the English aristocracy in the 18th century. Uh, but you look at these churches, San Giorgio Maggiore and uh, Irredentore, uh, and you see that they're, they're this wonderful combination of ah, a classical temple uh, but a, um, a classical temple, but also behind you see that it is a basilica with these uh, things extending on the side. Uh, 
with a dome uh, with all sorts of columns arranged in different crazy ways. You find that also in uh, San Giorgio Maggiore. Learn a lot from the tension of this, of, of, from the contradictions uh, that are evolved and the idea of Christian architecture evolving from a Roman law court and then connecting with Roman temples is fascinating. Next slide, please. So, Mannerist architecture is communication for our hype electronic information age, viva architecture of sign rather than space. This is my termination here. Architecture engaging mannerism rather than expressionism. And I had fun writing this. We are not ashamed to design buildings that look like buildings, that are naughty rather than nutty, <laughs> that are shelter rather than sculpture, that are generic rather than articulated, that are iconographic rather than abstract, that are good rather than original, that are mannerist rather than expressionist. Next two slides are the last. Oh, this one doesn't work here. Okay, it's just a, it's just a propaganda about what, I'm, what I've been saying. Uh, and then this is sort of an example of, of our loves. And we love Palazzo Valmarano, Alto, Castle Howard, Lobsters, Mae West. Do you know what a nerd is? Do you know nerds? I'm a nerd, so I, I love nerds. And we love chopstick holders, lobsters. We had a delicious lobster dinner last night with, with uh, Rem Coolhouse. I'm afraid that one's not here. Don't worry about it. It's okay. And so forth. So I think the main thing is, it, what's that? Oh, it is here. Okay. Viva mannerism over expressionism. Uh, the validity of clutter, viva the S word, sign. Uh, uh, viva vulgar vitality, viva banal generic and vulgar fanfare, modern mannerism, ugly and ordinary is better than heroic original. Also. So I think this kind of explains it. it we think this is a good time to be open and to learn from many sources. And uh, we are also loving. Uh, Holland. We should have put that in there. Thank you. Thank you.